Praise the Lord. Thank you for joining with me for Wednesday in the Word. Yeah, we're in the middle of the week, but we're in the time of the week where we get to come together and unite in the Word of God. You've already been fellowshipping in the Word up to this point during your devotional time, a reading time, a meditation time. But this is a time where we come together uh, to study the Word of God, to hear God speak to our hearts and our, our, and our minds through, through the Scriptures. So again, thank you for joining me. I appreciate uh, the commitment you have to the kingdom of God and to the household of faith here at Word Alive Church. Oh yes, we are the body of Christ and God has uh, strategically planted us here to do a work and uh, you are part of a good work and that work is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we're going to get ready to go right into the Word of God, and uh, if you see someone that uh, you are accustomed to seeing tuning in and they haven't been tuning in late, lately, just check in on them. Just give them a call and uh, send them a text message and tell them I've been missing you uh, joining us with uh, time for a Bible study, uh, and then uh, just encourage them. Uh, to come back and get at the table so they can feast in the Word of God. Well, let's just spend some time praying and worshiping God, and right where you are, go ahead and begin to talk to your Heavenly Father. He loves you, He cares for you, and He loves communicating with you. Father, we praise you now, and we honor you for Jesus Christ today, and thank you for the saving grace that Christ has brought forth in our life. Thank you for giving us the God kind of faith where we heard the message of Christ. We believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are saved. We are born again. And thank you, Lord God, that you have not left us without strength, without hope, without comfort, uh, without courage, but you've sent forth the Holy Spirit to dwell and live in us. Thank you, Father, for giving us this wonderful treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of you and not of ourselves. And now, Father, we thank you as we go through the book of Proverbs. We believe, God, that you have ordained that this word will be for the church this wisdom that you've given to the body of Christ. Uh, Father, the world don't understand it. The world cannot relate to it, but thank you for speaking into every arena of our lives, Father, that the light of the glory of, of God, the knowledge of God may shine, Father. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for uh, allowing us to be uh, 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 agents of truth and uh, receivers of truth, Father. The word of God is truth, and we praise you for that absolute truth. And and now, Lord, we pray that you will give us an understanding heart, that we will be able to understand the scriptures, and that we will be able to apply it in our lives. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Well, we're going right into Proverbs, and we're going to be going into chapter 4 today. And we're talking about prospering through Proverbs in every arena of life. The wisdom that God reveals in this particular book of Proverbs will cause believers, all of us who are trusting God and, and, and honoring God and acknowledging God in our ways, to be able to experience the success that God wants us to have in the earth. Not according to the world. We don't want to look through the carnal eyes or, uh, or carnal lens of the flesh and, and try to define success based on man's wisdom. But God gives us this particular book so that we can live a prosperous and successful life. So we can take the knowledge of his word and be able to apply it in every arena of our life. Doesn't mean we'll have a perfect life, but it means that we will have the spirit of God and we will have the power of God working in our favor. Well, I just want you to think about this, and especially those of us who are parents or those uh, uh, who have raised uh, uh, children, uh, there's a statement that perhaps a phrase that we may have used in our parenting uh, uh, journey, and it goes something like this, when I was your age. Oh yes, some of us have used that in trying to talk to our children, and a lot of times mothers use that, you know, especially when it comes to the girls or whatever the case may be. And, uh, and so in our lesson today, uh, Solomon, he says in verse number four, in uh, chapter four, verse three, he said, uh, when I was my father's son, notice when I was my father's son, <laughs> hallelujah, glory to God. In other words, when I was your age, <laughs> you know, he's trying to give some, he, he's imparting some wisdom unto his son and God is providing wisdom unto the body of Christ. And so, so Solomon said, when I was my father's son. 
Now, up to this point, uh, God's wisdom through Solomon has informed us on how wisdom protects our life. Yeah, wisdom is like a security guard, man, and, and wisdom protects our life. And it also, uh, we have looked at how God's wisdom directs our path. Yes, yes, God, wisdom, bring direction to our path. But today in chapter four, I believe what Solomon is trying to communicate is how God's wisdom will perfect our path. Yes, yes. Once we became born again, we entered a course where uh, God is perfecting our path. In Psalms 138, verse 8, the psalmist put it like this, uh, The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. Uh, we often talk about the saving grace, but there is a perfecting grace that God has made available for our life. And it follows, it follows saving grace. It is where we get to choose if or not we will not only enter God's plan for our lives, but allow God to perfect that plan along our life journey. That's why it's important when Christians come into the family of God, uh, people come into the kingdom of God, that they make sure that they get what? They get that word deposit in them. Why? Because now they've entered the school of what I call perfecting grace. In John chapter 10, Jesus said in verse 7 and verse 9 and 10, uh, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. Yes, that's salvation. That's, one translation say, I am the door. In other words, if you're going to come into the family of God, you have to come through the Lord Jesus Christ. He went on to say, whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So once we come into the kingdom of God, we receive his saving grace. It is, it is his perfecting grace that causes us to be able to silence the plan and the plot and the cunning craftiness of the devil against our life. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but he will not steal, kill, and destroy in our life. Why? Because we're on a path of perfecting grace. And on this path, God is bringing us or has have brought us in the place where we can live life to the full. We can live life to the overflow. We can live life to the place of abundance. Hallelujah. And the devil can't stop it. Well, let's look at some other scripture. I want us to look at some New Testament scripture so you can really grab what I mean when Solomon talks about this perfecting grace. In Ephesians 2 and 10, the Amplified Bible reads like this. For we are his workmanship, his own masterwork, a work of art, created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, and ready to be used for good works, which God prepared for us beforehand, taking paths which he set so that we would walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us. Oh, thank God that get this. We are God workmanship, his handiwork. One translation, we are God's tools or his instruments. And get this, so that God has set this thing so we can live the good life. Oh man, when we in Christ, when we're in Christ, we live the good life. We don't live the good life because we have all the things of this world. We live the good life because we're in Christ. And man, he is perfecting that work that he started in our life. Well, Philippians 1 and 6 make it really plain. It reads like this. Paul said, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. I'm telling you, when I first got born again, that scripture helped me get up a lot of times. Get up from what? For get up from falling down. Oh, you know, you grow up and people give that religion and they have stuff like, you know, I looked at my hands, my hand was changed. I looked at my feet. Oh, glory to God. Lying right in church and don't even realize. A religion that calls you to lie in church and don't even realize. No, our hand didn't change. Our feet didn't change. What, what, what happened was God's spirit came into us. And now what? That perfecting grace. 
And that doesn't mean you're perfect, especially if you're new in Christ. Or you got to learn how to walk in Christ. You got to learn how to live out your salvation. Hallelujah. And that takes time. That takes disciples, you know, being discipled and all of that. But that, that scripture used to encourage me because once I read that scripture, I said, okay, God is not finished with me yet. Or you can sing about it, but you got to know it. And you know it best when you're getting up from falling down. And I don't care how holy you think you are. I can assure you somewhere on this journey, you had to get up. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. But thank God he gives us getting up grace. I ain't never heard that one before, but getting up grace to get back in the race. Hallelujah. That's that part of that perfecting grace. Well, Philippians 2, 12 and 13, a lot of times when people try to live for the Lord, they try to live in their own human strength and don't understand the Holy Spirit, don't understand, you know, prayer and all those things yet. And they find out that when they depend on their own strength, your strength run out. Well, in Philippians 2, 12 and 13, listen to what the word of God say. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. I mean, that's revelation knowledge right there. Oh, yeah. He didn't say work for your salvation. He said work it out. That's perfecting grace. And get this. God is working in you. God is helping you. God is empowering you. God is enabling us. So what? So that we can do his will in the earth. It's not through human strength and effort and, you know, mind control and all of this kind of stuff. It's by the grace of God. It's by the perfecting grace that God brings in our life. So, here we see then, God is committed to perfecting his plan in those who enter into his plan of saving grace. God is committed to that. That's why Philippians 1, 6 tells us, it encourages us, well, that he's still working with you. You're not a, uh, you know, you're not a perfect uh, 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 specimen of, of what God called you to be yet. I mean, in his righteousness we are, but we're still in the flesh. So what he's doing, he's perfecting his nature on the inside of us. He's perfecting his character on the inside of us. But God is committed to it. Now, let's see how God's wisdom will enable us to flow in harmony with God with his perfecting path that he leads us on. Yes, we want to flow in harmony. We don't want to work against God. We want to work in what? In agreement with the spirit of God. Well, in Proverbs 4, we're going to examine some things here that I believe we need to know in order to do that. The first one is this, is that we have to be willing to put in the work. You see, in Proverbs 4, 1 through 13, in verse 4, uh, the writer said, He also taught me and said to me, let your heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. Notice let your heart retain my words. That word retain means to continue to have. It means to keep possession of. It means to keep in one's memory. Wisdom is not a one-time fix. God's wisdom is not seasonal, but God's wisdom is a lifetime journey. You never get to a certain point in your age where you claim that you have all the wisdom that you need. Now, I'm not talking about that kind of wisdom that we uh, classify about being elderly. Now, we have more experience, but I've seen some elderly people that don't have no wisdom of God. They have worldly wisdom. They've been through with some experiences. As they say, I've been here longer than you, but what have you been doing since you've been here? You should have been what? Filling your heart with the word of God. It requires work, and we have to be willing to put in the work. In verse number three, he said this, when I was my father's son tender and the only one in the sight of my mother. Who that? That's David and Bathsheba. And he said that evidently they poured wisdom on the inside of Solomon. Not only did dad, but mom poured wisdom into him. And I, you know, he used the word tender and the only one in the sight of my mother. Now, you know, you would think that uh, when Solomon speaks of his mother, he's not speaking of someone who did everything for him. No, she taught him. And I think that's very important with, 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 with fathers and mothers. You want to teach and you want to train and you want to be preparing them what? So they can transition into life and become independent. 
Oh man, you got some people now, as long as there's children right under them all their life, they just feel like they're the happiest person in the world. And, now, and perhaps they were raised up that way. And that's a spirit that's, that, first of all, that is an un, uh, unhealthy relationship. Yes, that's unhealthy. No, God does not give us children so we can be like a, you know, a hen or a chicken with all of the beaters all around everywhere she go. Them beaters going to grow up one day. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It's okay to see a little, you know, a hen with some beaters. But man, if I can see a hen and it got a bunch of hens all around them, I'm like, something wrong with that, that, with that, that picture there. Them hens supposed to go out and do something with their life. Well, Solomon's parents prepared him. They put wisdom on the inside of him. They made a deposit of wisdom on the inside of him. In verse 5, he said, get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. What's the words of his mouth? The word of God. The wisdom of God is the word of God. Now, in verse number 6, listen to this now. Solomon said, do not forsake her, and she will preserve you, love her, and she will keep you. Now, Solomon, in Proverbs, he continually warns us concerning the strange woman. <laughs> yeah, what he was telling this boy, watch out for that strange woman. So Proverbs talks about that. But here, he encourages us toward the wise woman in which he uses figuratively for instructions in wisdom. In other words, the wise woman of wisdom will protect and guard you if you love her. Now notice that, if you love her, because verse 6 says, love her and she will keep you. You know, there was a time a woman would say, I'll fight for my man. Well, if he doesn't have wisdom, uh, that might be a fight. <laughs> you want to stop fighting. <laughs> you want to fight. You know, Proverbs say, if you love her, oh man, she's going to protect you. And I think we can look at it another way. When a woman knows that her husband or her man love her, oh man, uh, she, she got to be a strange woman if she won't respond to that in a healthy way, in a way of faithfulness and, and just motivation and stuff. Because she feel love. She feel like, you know, uh, he, get this, he loved me above his own mother. And if you're married, I'm telling you, that's a different relationship. But I've seen a lot of relationships where people couldn't leave mother and father and cleave to their husband and wife. And a lot of times those marriages don't use the last, last because that's not God's order. But no, no, here the Bible say, if you love her, oh my God. I remember that was a song. If you love me the way you do, why you treat me the way you do? But the Bible say, if you love her, if you love wisdom, wisdom is going to protect you. Uh, listen to it from the Amplified Bible. Say, forsake not wisdom and she will keep, defend, protect you, love her, and she will guard you. Glory to God. I mean, she's going to protect you. She's going to take care of you, but you have to love her. So the next thing we notice, he says in verse 7, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom in all you're getting, get understanding. So here again, what? It requires work. Lazy people not going to have the wisdom of God. You know, uh, let, let me tell you something, Christian. We have to be diligent. And you know, we're diligent in the word. We got to be diligent in the other areas of our life. Because when you got a lazy spirit about you, a slothful spirit, and you know, all you want to do is lay around and always tired and, you know, and all this stuff. Nah, man, you in the, you got the Holy Ghost in you now. Hallelujah. I mean, sometimes you listen to Christians. Before they got saved, they had all kind of energy. Oh, man, they can stay up all night and go out all night and get up and go to work and go to school. And now these saved Christians, man, every time I look around, how you doing? I'm just tired. I'm tired. I mean, their last name should be tired, you know. No, no, we got the Holy Ghost. I mean, we need to get rest. But, man, I'm telling you what, we don't want to be lazy. Why? We got to put in the work. Listen, you got to put in the work if you're going to get this wisdom. And it's well worth it. Well, let's look at another thing. In verse 8, here again, here go that wise woman. Hallelujah. Exalt her and she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. The other thing is, uh, uh, this wisdom will help us gain positions of influence. 
Oh, yeah, sometimes, you know, people will say when you see a man and you're doing something successful, they say behind every good man is a good woman. Well, that's not really Bible. <laughs> now, you got to understand that and everything. But I tell you what, if you find a man that embraces wisdom and you find a woman that embraces wisdom, you're going to see wisdom show up in their life. God is doing that. There ain't no man doing that. I mean, you see a woman and you see her well, you know, taking care of and everything going well for her. People say, oh, man, that husband, it, it, that's God doing all that. We got to stop giving people credit for the grace of God. Hallelujah. You know, uh, you know, one fellow, I remember one time he thought he was so handsome and everything and, you know, and uh, all caught up in himself. I tell you what, see, when you get saved, the glory of God come on your life. And you ain't out there trying to win no beauty contests and, and you know, and most real, you know, real men ain't looking at how good they look. That's not a real man thing, you know. But, uh, but, but, but when you have the glory of God on your life, I'm telling you right now, that makes a difference. Oh, it keeps you vibrant. It keeps you youthful. It keeps you. Uh, it, keep, it keeps you active in life. Glory to God. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Glory. You take care of yourself because of the image of God that has come alive on the inside of you. You feel good about yourself. Get this now. Listen, single women. You don't take care of yourself when a man come in your life. You take care of yourself because Jesus is in your life. You keep yourself looking good because Jesus is in your life. And that's the way we have to realize. Paul said, I am who I am by the grace of God. It's God's image that's on the inside of us now. They have come alive. We realize we are truly in the image, in the likeness of our creator. So this, this, this wise woman help us gain positions of influence. Listen to it from the Amplified Bible, verse 8. Prize wisdom highly and exalt her, and she will exalt and promote you. She will bring you to honor when you embrace her. You know God will raise you up even in this natural world, and no man will be able to get the credit or glory for it. You won't be able to be able to talk about your education did this for you or your connections did this for you or whatever bishop or, or who you came under did this for you. You will recognize that you are who you are by the grace of God. And everything that you have gained in this world, which is temporal, God has entrusted unto you because of your stewardship, because of your faithfulness and and because of your generous heart. Yes, that's how we get the abundance even of things when God know that he can entrust us with this. We will be good stewards. We will be faithful. We will honor him with the first fruits of everything we get. Hallelujah. Well, let's go on. He goes on in verse 9. Say, she will place uh, on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory. She will deliver. In other words, she'll cause you to look good even on the outside. Hallelujah, man. Hallelujah. Verse 10 say, hear my son and receive my sins in the years of your life will be many. She will help us live a good long life. Oh, man. I, all we got to do is love wisdom. If you love wisdom, if you love this woman called wisdom, glory to God, she's going to protect you, she's going to guard you, she's going to cause you to come to a place of influence, she's going to give you positions in life, she's going to raise you up and prosper you, she's going to give you a good long life, hallelujah. You're not going to be old and cranky and old and just hating everybody and mad at everybody because you're getting old, no, you're going to get old gracefully, hallelujah. Well, let's go on. And, and uh, uh, verse number 11, verse number 11 said, I have taught you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in right paths. When you walk, uh, your steps will not be hindered. And when you run, you will not stumble. Wisdom will cause us to avoid obstacles and hindrances on our path. Yes, that's what she will do for you. This woman called wisdom will do it for us. Glory to God. That's why I tell you when people try to work against you, they can't stop you when you have the wisdom of God. Hallelujah. I don't care if they don't like you. And you got people now. Don't, don't go around telling everybody everybody love you. Everybody don't love you. I'm telling you right now. There's people don't like your personality. There's some people don't like the way you do things. People don't like the way you walk. They don't like the way you talk. They don't like the way you look. People just like that. Hallelujah. Thank God you're not a people pleaser though. Uh, and, uh, but, but those hindrances and obstacles the woman called wisdom said, I'll take care of them. I'll move them out of your way. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Get this. When you got the woman of wisdom, you ain't got to climb no mountains. <laughs> Hallelujah. You ain't got to climb no mountains. Uh, somebody was saying something about, you know, they were talking about climbing on the rough side of the mountain. 
Somebody said, why don't they go around and climb up the smooth side? Listen, I'm not climbing up the rough side. I'm not climbing up the smooth side. <laughs> I'm speaking to that mountain. I'm going to do what Jesus said in Mark 11, 23. Hallelujah. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall believe in his heart that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever. He said, I'm speaking to the mountain. Glory to God. I ain't singing about climbing it. Glory to God. I ain't got time to climb no mountain. I ain't got no time to go around them. I'm speaking to it and commanded it in the name of Jesus to get out of my way and go into the sea of forgetfulness. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, I'm getting excited because that's the word. The word of God gets me excited. Well, verse 13 says this. Take firm hold of instruction. Do not let go. Keep her for she is your life. In other words, this is why the work is well worth it. That's why it's worth it. Why? Wisdom is our life. We can't live without wisdom. We can't live without God's word. Glory to God. It's our life. That's why if, if, if you're in a backslidden condition today, you can't live like that. No, no, you can't live like that. Turn around and repent in the name of Jesus and get back on course with God. God has not moved. God is right there waiting on you. Why? Because you can't live without him. Hallelujah. I think we sang a song. I can't live without him. That's true. We don't want to live without it. And that's what wisdom says. When you meet this woman, you can't. Yeah, listen, listen, listen. Some people are doing some negative things to their life. Some people try to talk about taking their life because somebody walk out of their life. Talking about I can't live without that person. Listen, the only person you and I can't live without is this woman right here. Hallelujah. Called wisdom. Yes, God's word. We, we don't want to live without that. Hallelujah. But let's move on, okay? We're going to go down now into verses 14 through 19. And this is the lesson we can gain here is this. We will have to be willing to walk it out. Yes, we not only have to be willing to put in the work, but we got to be willing to walk it out. I remember uh, uh, when I was young and I was playing baseball and uh, the pitcher threw the ball and hit me. And as soon as the pitcher threw the ball and hit me, uh, I hope he wasn't doing it intentionally. <laughs> but anyway, when he hit me with the ball, the guys over on my dugout, and my dugout started screaming, walk it out, walk it out. Well, I'm going to let you know right now, I didn't walk it out. In other words, what they were saying, just go ahead and start going to the base. I started going to the pitcher's mound with that bat. <laughs> I was going to knock that fell out, you know. And see, the pitcher's going to be thinking. You know, they don't have the ball anymore. They don't put down one weapon. Then they'll throw the glove down and come toward you. Here you come in. The only little weapon you had was the glove. You're going to throw it down, and here I got the bat in my hand. <laughs> but but sometimes even in baseball, when you, I, I mean basketball, when a person you get an ankle, uh, uh, something happened to their ankle, the first thing they say, walk it out, walk it out. What they're saying, put a little pressure on it and keep moving. Well, when it comes to wisdom, we got to learn how to walk it out. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to have to learn how to press in. We're going to have to keep on moving. We're going to have to learn how to resist some things and keep letting wisdom what? Lead us on that path of perfecting grace. Hallelujah. I'm telling you what God has us on the path of perfecting grace. Wisdom instructs us in, uh, in, in, in the paths that we are to take. And there, here now in verse 14 through 19, uh, uh, he makes a contrast between uh, the path of the just and the path of the wicked. Listen, listen. Do not enter the path of the wicked, verse 14, and do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn away from it and pass on. For they do not sleep unless they have done evil, and their sleep is taken away unless they make someone fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But now, now, now look at verse 18. Here is, here, here is another path. But the path of the just is as a shining sun, a light, that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. Now you go back to that other path. Verse 19. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. When we enter God's plan for our life through saving grace, we don't know how and what that plan may look like. However, we know in whom we are trusting for that plan, and we believe according to Jeremiah 29, 11, that the plan that God has us on, on in the path that we're on, there is hope, there is help, and there is a bright future. We don't know all the in and outs. We don't know uh, when we may have events to occur 
that could be very challenging and very uh, 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 bring suffering in our life. But however, we do know this, that there's hope and there's help and there's a bright future on the path of perfecting grace. Jeremiah 29, 11, Amplified Bible say, For I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Thoughts and plans for welfare and peace and not for evil to give you hope in your final outcome. You know, a lot of time when evil come in people's life, people always say, look at God. God say, that ain't part of my plan. That ain't part of my plan, but I'm going to give you hope in the midst of whatever you're facing. I'm going to give you hope in the midst of a fallen world. And not only am I going to give you hope, but I'm going to give you peace. Glory to God. And I'm going to give you a future. I'm going to give you an outlook on life. You're going to be able to look through the lens of faith. You're going to be able to look through the lens of my word, regardless of what happens in this life. You're not putting on the lens of fear. You're not putting on the glasses of doubt and unbelief, but you have on the lens of faith. And you're always trusting God, regardless of what occurs within the context of one's life. Now, here's the plan of the wicked. The plan of the wicked have no hope, they don't have no help, but only deception and corruption as its goal. You see, the wicked person is not, not just the average unbeliever. Because if you notice in verse number 16, the Bible says, for they do not sleep until they have done evil. In other words, this wicked cannot even get rest till they find out some, what, what can I do that's evil today? What kind of violence? What kind of crime can I commit today? Who can I rob today? Who can I take advantage? Get this. Who can I steal from today? These are wicked people. Yes. These are wicked people. Notice the Bible, has, and get this, the Bible says, for they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. That's what they get How? That's what turned them on. Doing evil, doing unrighteous things, violence. And then the Bible says in verse 19, uh, the way of the wicked is like darkness. And get this, they are so deceived, they do not know what makes them stumble. Now that's the kind of wicked person in a wicked path they're on. They don't realize the destruction that they're bringing on their own lives. They are so deceived. And I don't know, you may have met some people like that. <laughs> you may have some in your family. That, that, that no matter what you say to them, they keep doing uh, 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 destructive things. And then when it's time to reap the consequences, or oh, they want to make some excuse or get, or get this, somebody go bail them out. <laughs> and they never change and they never grow up. Well, Proverbs say, that's what a wicked path look like, you know? They don't even realize what they're stumbling at. They think they got it going on. They get this, they'll tell you, I'm going to be rich one day, and they can't even, you know, can't even buy food for themselves, but they're going to be rich one day, <laughs> telling everybody that. Nah, nah, God say, the path of the just is as a shining light. Now, what that mean? It's like the break, it's like, it's like the starting of the day when the dawn come in. And the morning come and then noontime and all of a sudden, what? That's how it is when we are on the path of perfecting grace. Uh, we may not uh, have the answer all the time, but if you stay on the path, God's going to illuminate that path. And that light going to get brighter. And you're going to gain knowledge and understanding and you're going to gain wisdom as you keep walking with God. Hallelujah. And then they're going to be what? They're going to come the day where we have no need. Hallelujah. Of the light of the world because Revelation 22, I think along verse 5, talks about Christ being the light. Hey, when we get the glory, the, the Jesus is going to shine. The glory of God is going to shine all around us. And that is the wonderful light that Jesus brings. Well, let me get ready to close because the last part of Proverbs uh, chapter 4, verse 20 and 27, the lesson we can learn here is this. We have to be willing to watch over our wisdom. Oh, yes. You know, if, if we don't guard the wisdom, we're putting into our hearts the enemy of wisdom. There's an enemy of wisdom, Satan. And the carnal nature of the flesh will lure us into paths that take us from the path of of perfecting grace to the path of perfecting pride in ungodly pursuits. That's why we got to guard our wisdom. We got to protect it. We got to watch over it. First, we have to watch where we will focus our attention and active participation. Look at verse number 20. Notice what 
the voice of wisdom says, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sins. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. We have to be willing to focus our attention and active participation on wisdom. We got to meditate on it. We got to get it in our heart. We got to keep pouring it in our heart. We got to keep speaking it out of our mouth. We got to keep praying and asking God for it. We got to watch over that wisdom. And then the second thing we have to do, we have to watch what we will allow to enter the gate of our heart. Look at verse 23. He said, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. Guard your heart above anything else you have because it determines the kind of life you and I will live. We've got to guard our heart. You see, the heart is the master control of the life. It's like a main switch on a breaker box. <laughs> you, can, you can turn off the switch to the laundry room. You can turn off the switch to the oven. You can turn off the switch to the bedroom. You can turn off all these different switches. But when you get down there and you see where it says the master switch, it turns everything off. And what happens is when we guard our heart, we guard our heart because if we are not careful, there can, there, can, there, there, there can be stuff that get in our heart can shut down everything else. Shut down our love. Shut down our mercy. Shut down our long suffering. Shut down our perseverance. Shut down our prayer life. Oh, but thank God we're going to guard our heart. Why? Life, the things that pertain to life, how I'm going to live a successful life, a victorious life, all begin where? With my heart. Now, Solomon provides three powerful influencing forces of our hearts. Three, these forces will determine what's in our heart. The first one he identifies in verse number 24. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips <coughs> far from you. The first place we have to look is the words we practice and promote out of our mouth. You see, it is our responsibility to season our words. That is to cause them to have the flavor of God and the favor of God <coughs> revealed through them. In Colossians chapter <coughs> 4 verse 6, 5 and 6 says, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, <coughs> redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer every man. Notice, notice, God said that our words have to be seasoned, have to always have love in them. Yes, that's a, that, that, but it got to be seasoned with what? Seasoned with salt. What? That's going to give it the flavor of God. That's going to be, that's going to change uh, how our words impact others. Hallelujah. Jesus revealed in the heart is influenced by the words in it, and those words will come out from it through the security gate of the mouth. Here is the question. Who is on watch at the door of your mouth? Is it a clean heart or is it an unclean heart? And Matthew 15 was the psalm of Jesus' discernment with the Pharisees of his day. And when he summed up the whole matter, it was basically the Pharisees' mouth was revealing their unclean heart. Jesus said it like this in Matthew 15, 11. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a man. Then he goes on in verse 17 through 20 of Matthew 15. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. 
You see, the Pharisees was focused on the fact that Jesus' disciples didn't wash their hands before they ate. <laughs> and they just figured that, you know, what they did defiled them. No, no. Whether you wash your hands or not does not affect your heart. It can affect your health. It can affect things around. We see that now. But it don't affect the master control center. What affects the master control center is the words that we use. And based on the words that we practice and that we promote out of our mouth determines the condition of our heart. And nobody going to walk around saying, I got an unclean heart. <laughs> but you listen to their words. And I'm not talking about profanity. You know, I'm not talking about people that, oh, look at that, cursing, cursing. Oh, but man, there's a lot of other things. You can lie on somebody. You can slander. Oh, man, I mean, words can destroy a person's whole reputation. Yes, words have power. In James 3, 6, saying the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. Wow, this little thing in our mouth we call the tongue. The Bible say this, this, this thing is like fire. It can burn up something. It can, burn, it can tear down something. What he's talking about? He's not talking about the little pink thing. He's talking about the words that come out of our mouth. Listen to Isaiah 50, because I think sometimes when we look at our words, see, we're going to practice. See, you got to practice these things. That means you got to practice using the right words, the word of God coming out of our mouth. Praying the word, speaking the word, thanking the word, you know, responding with the word. What that does? That changes my heart. Why? Those words are coming from somewhere. When we put wisdom in our heart, wisdom going to come out of our mouth. When we put the word of God in our heart, the word of God will come out of our mouth. Listen to Isaiah 50 in verse 4. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning, he awakens, he awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. When we start our day, we need to start our day getting a word from God. We need to start our day uh, uh, thinking on the word of God. We need to start our day speaking the word of God. Why? Because the Bible says God has given us the tongue of the learned. So that means that I can have the right words at the right time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I can have the right heart. Why? I've got the right words. Well, let's go on. In Proverbs 10, 11, say the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but violence overwhelms the mouth of the wicked. You see, the wicked can't come out with no good words. The wicked words is all about what? Violence and destruction and evil and all that tearing down things and, and destroying things. Oh, but the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. I believe right now, if you're born again, if you've got Jesus in your heart, I believe God has given us the, exactly what we need, that our mouth, our words can be a fountain of life. Oh, glory. To, I mean, if somebody dying of thirst, when they meet us or when we speak the words to them, it's going to bring a refreshing. All right. Proverbs 15 and 1 says this. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. You know, when people start arguing, they are, they, they, they're not arguing <laughs> unless they can't speak. They might be arguing in sign language. And I wonder what that looked like when a husband and wife and both of them may not be able to speak and they know a sign language. Boy, that could be a pretty good fight. You know, <laughs> and everything. but those of us who got words, oh, man, when you get an argument, how do you know? Boy, words come from all over the place, right? Oh, they, oh it come up. It, they'll come up and everything and I believe some of them the enemy is throwing out there he's just throwing them out there in the air and then Christians are grabbing hold I'm going to say this I'm going to say that but the Bible says, get this a soft answer glory to God you got somebody talking harsh to you you got someone coming at blaming you accusing you and you know the natural man going to get defensive yeah you know <laughs> who ate my food ready to fight everybody <laughs> And all of a sudden, there's a sweet sound come. Uh, no, I didn't touch your food. Now, what that brought everything down. A soft answer can make people hear how foolish they really sound with all that screaming and yelling and raising their voice. And listen, husband and wife, you know you know how it is sometimes. You got to work on that. You got to be able to say, you can't make the excuse now. Well, you know, you caused me to do it. You know, you started it. Now you've started now. I'm ready to finish it. No, no, them children are looking and learning. That's how you handle. No, the Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath or anger. 
in everything. Uh, Proverbs 25, 25 says this, like cold water to a weary soul is good news from a distant land. You know what I believe that is? That's the gospel. Oh, we, you know what? If we share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's good news. Oh, it's going to bring a refreshing to somebody. They're dying spiritually. They don't know Christ. They, they, they're seeking the things of the world. They're trying to get satisfied. And here we come with good news from the word of God. So we're able to do what? <clears throat> We're able to do good things with our words. Don't focus on the negative things. They, they're out there. They're wicked words, anger and all that. But let's focus on letting that be a fountain of life, uh, getting up with the tongue of the learned, hallelujah, uh, 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 giving a soft answer when somebody's being harsh. See, we got to practice it. And if we practice it, it's going to be promoted and it's going to what? It's going to guard our heart. It's going to change our heart. But let's move on. Verse 25, listen to another thing. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. In other words, by focusing our sight on things that strengthen our faith. We got to do that now. We got to guard our eye gate. Why? Because through the eye gate, it gets to the heart. So we're going to start having to focus on things that's going to strengthen our faith. That's going, And I think that's meditating on the word of God, keeping the right things in front of our eye gate. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But let's move on. Uh, 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 the next one is in verse number 26 and 27. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or the left. Remove your foot from evil by examining the direction of our life. Oh, yeah. I believe that these are ways that we can determine what's in our heart by the words that we use by what we allow to focus our attention on, what we allow to put in front of our eye gate, and by the decisions that we make relative to the direction of our life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, prospering through Proverbs in every arena of life comes with understanding God's perfecting grace on his perfecting path in life. You see, wisdom says this path get brighter and brighter as we travel it. So I want to encourage you to keep walking on this path. Hallelujah. Don't turn off. Oh, it's going to get brighter and brighter. That's revelation knowledge. That's greater understanding. That get the, that's more wisdom. Yeah, we are pouring that wisdom on the inside of our heart. Glory to God. So in chapter 4, Solomon provided what God's wisdom looked like. We have to be willing to put in the work. We have to be willing to walk it out. And we have to be willing to watch over our wisdom. And therefore, the master control center, the heart, fully running, hallelujah, got all the other circuits running fully because what? The master control center of the heart is full of wisdom, full of knowledge, and full of understanding. Hallelujah. Well, as I close, as I normally do, some faith action questions, just questions that cause us to uh, think, what adjustments do you sense you need to make to ensure you are retaining the words of wisdom? Maybe someone need to make some adjustment. Maybe they got to change your schedule. Maybe you got to start getting back to some discipline so that you can retain the words of wisdom. You know, don't be talking about, you know, always talking about, I remember when. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember when. Now get some fresh manner. And, just be, and, and start seeing God in the present. Glory to God. Thank God for the past testimony. But see him in the present. See, see some things you did in the past you're doing also in the present to build wisdom on the inside of your heart. Another question is, do you want to change your words? If so, why not begin with praying and placing priority on practicing using the tongue of the learned? Yeah, that's how you change your word. You don't sit there saying, well, I'm going to stop saying that. I'm going to stop saying Start saying what is righteous. Start saying what is a, a, a honorable. Start speaking with the tongue of the learned. Yes, hallelujah. That means, boy, when you wake up in the morning, God is writing his will, his, his word uh, on your uh, tongue. Glory to God. It's coming out of your mouth in the name of Jesus. And the last one is, what in your opinion does examining one's heart look like? And how can you begin to guard it and keep it producing? springs of life for out of the heart flows the issue the springs of life and we believe those are refreshing springs of life well thank you for joining me in the word of god i just love fellowshipping in the word and everything and you know we we just get excited about the word you know i was talking to someone earlier today and they were telling me about you know the, the ministry here word alive and everything and uh and you know some of us I, I i don't know about you but i love to just hear the word of god i don't need all of that emotional hype and you know i love to praise the lord but i don't need somebody to make me feel good <laughs> i don't need nobody to rub my flesh you know i just want somebody to feed my faith and that's what the word of god does it feeds our faith i mean even you you can read your bible it's feeding your faith it's doing something to your spirit uh, but, for, but thank you for making God's word a priority and meeting us here at 
the fellowship meal, the word of God. This month, we will begin joining together our resources along with others uh, in joining uh, with our generation for God. Our youth ministry at World Alive Church, they, they, they've uh, heard the heartbeat of our city. There's a need for food. Harvest Hope Food Bank, we've always worked with them and we want to continue to do so. And this is a crucial time uh, for the, uh, the, the church to respond and try to help minister to people's needs. And so uh, on Saturday, December the 5th from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m., our youth are going to be out here with a drive-by uh, food drive. So we want you to uh, plan and let people know to come by, drop off some non-perishable good food items, and we're going to put them together, and then we're going to uh, get them transported uh, to Harvest Hope. So that's going to be on Saturday, December the 5th, 1 to 3 p.m., and on Sunday, December the 6th, from 1 to 3 p.m. So we want to encourage you, please come take part of that this particular weekend. Uh, do it for the glory of God and to be able to be a blessing to other people. Uh, this Sunday... We will be providing in-person worship as well as virtual worship. So we'll have that going on. In-person worship will be at 10 a.m. And virtual worship will be at 11 a.m. And also this first Sunday is our Financial Discipleship Sunday. And I want to encourage and thank the saints for being faithful to the Lord. Again, I believe our giving is motivated by our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what season we're in. It doesn't matter what's going on in our world. God never changes. Word never changes. We're just going to be faithful. We're going to honor him with the first fruits of all of our increase. The tithe is the Lord. It is holy unto the Lord. We bring offerings willingly out of a cheerful heart in the wonderful name of Jesus. God bless you and have a great day in the name of Jesus.